This has an effect on the rock itself, which we can quite clearly read in the characteristics of the rock. We can read it most clearly in the characteristics of schist. You'll remember that we looked at schist at the beginning of the program as an example of a typical metamorphic rock. These plates of mica that you can see perhaps glistening are new mineral grains in the schist and they have grown in an aligned fashion. They're all parallel to one another. As you can see in this diagram here, the plates all lie flat and that's because the new mineral grains, the grains of the mica, have grown in the way that was easiest for them to grow. They've grown like that with the pressure acting down on top of them. It's much easier to grow out in that direction um, at right angles to the pressure than it would be to grow uh, against the pressure. And that characteristic of flat mica plates arranged in layers in schists, we call foliation. Foliation coming from the Latin word for leaves. The schists look rather like the leaves of a book. If you take a hammer, you can quite easily split a schist right along the plane of orientation of the mica grains. In schists, we call that foliation sometimes schistosity. This is another name that you'll meet when you read about metamorphic rocks. Schistosity is simply a variety of the general uh, term foliation. Now, the growth of minerals in liquids is very easy to envisage. The growth of pyroxene and the growth of olivine and the growth of the other minerals which make up igneous rocks was very easy to envisage when we were talking about igneous malts, simply minerals growing in liquids. Salt growing in water is another example. It's easy to envisage. But minerals growing in rocks, that's not so easy to envisage. We've talked of micas having grown in rocks to form the schists. There are also garnets which grow in rocks to form very obvious new mineral crystals growing in the solid rock. Then also storolite is another example that we've, that we've looked at. Remember the one from the Clarabelle Mill area? That new mineral storolite was also growing in solid rock. This is really rather difficult to envisage. And some of those minerals, especially the garnet, grow with what seems to be an enormous strength, is perhaps the best way to describe it. The, the garnets really seem to sort of burst out or, or, or grow with tremendous pressure within the rock. And you can sometimes see this in specimens themselves. In, for example, this one. Uh, you can perhaps see, although it is rather difficult at a distance, the way that the crystals around the garnet seem to have been pushed aside as the garnet grew. Now, that really is rather a difficult process to envisage. As I mentioned, in a liquid, it's easy. But in a solid rock, how on earth does a crystal, does a new mineral crystal grow in a solid rock? Now, in order to try and explain that, we can look at a familiar substance steel, cut for the purpose of this experiment into a disc and then polished. The disc is placed into the temperature chamber of a special microscope and then heated to about 850 degrees centigrade. The microscope shows that at this temperature, well below its melting point of about 1500 degrees centigrade, the steel is still solid and formed of a mass of interlocking crystals, just like a rock. If the temperature is raised still higher, but kept still well below the melting point of the steel, the microscope shows that atoms must be moving around in the steel, just like a rock during metamorphism. This behavior of steel has to do with the migration of carbon atoms, which are used to harden the steel. The carbon is normally in the form of little islands of iron carbide in the softer steel. When the steel is heated, the atomic structure changes. And when the steel is cold, the iron crystal is cubic. 
with an atom at the center of the cube, in addition to those at the corners. This is a structure known as body-centered cubic, and characteristic then of the cold steel. When the iron is heated, the structure expands. You can think of the steel being metamorphosed. At red heat, the central iron atom can fit into one face. And there's room at the remaining faces for the other iron atoms from the iron carbide islands. And at the very center of the structure, the carbon atom from the iron carbide can be absorbed. The crystal structure, in fact, has changed as the iron was metamorphosed, if you like. And this makes the steel very much easier to work. It's softer. On slow cooling, in contrast to metamorphism, the extra carbon and iron atoms are expelled, and the structure shrinks back to body-centered cubic, typical of the cold steel. Although the steel is a good example to show the mobility of atoms in a solid, the analogy ends there. Remember the difference between what happened with the steel when it was heated and then cooled again, and what happens in metamorphism. When the steel was cooled, the structure of the iron went back to the structure when the uh, steel was originally cold. Now that doesn't happen in metamorphism. Once the new minerals are produced, the garnets or the muscovite or whatever, then they don't go back to their original state. The process of metamorphism is much more like baking a brick than it is uh, making steel hot in order to, to work it. When you take clay and you fire a brick in an oven, there isn't any way you can go back to the clay again. You've got a pot or a brick or whatever it happens to be, and if you grind it up into small pieces, all you get are small pieces of pot or small pieces of brick. You don't go back to clay. And so it is with, with metamorphism. So bear in mind that difference when you, you remember the example of steel. Now, we've looked so far at processes. We've looked at the processes which produce new minerals, the mobility of atoms in a solid, um, <clears throat> and how they recombine to produce new minerals stable under new conditions of temperature and pressure. We've mentioned the fact that when new minerals grow under the application of pressure, then they grow at right angles to the pressure in order to minimize the strain on them. And that produces a structure we call foliation, best seen in the schists. Now, of course, the application of heat and pressure is a progressive process. The temperature doesn't suddenly become 600 degrees, and the pressure doesn't suddenly become the pressure of 100 people on a sugar cube. The pressure slowly increases, and the temperature slowly increases. And let's have a look at a series of rocks which illustrate the differences as the, the temperature and the pressure slowly increase. The starting point of our series is shale, the sedimentary rock shale. Application of heat and pressure produces slate from the shale. And further application produces the rock that we call phyllite, already beginning to look quite different from the shale. And then schist, a rock that you find quite a lot of down Highway 69, for example, sparkling with muscovite plates. And then nice, another common rock down Highway 69. And then finally, a variety of nice, which begins to look very like granite. So the progressive application of heat and pressure to the sedimentary rock shale eventually produces something that looks like granite. That's a dramatic change, a very dramatic change. How does that occur? Let's have a look at the progressive changes from one rock to the other. Now, in the shale, a sedimentary rock, you'll remember, formed of clay minerals, those clay minerals being small and platy and related in their appearance and properties to the micas, the platy minerals are arranged in rather a random fashion. In fact, there's a little bit of orientation, as you can see, which gives rise to the ability of the shale to break along its bedding planes. But on the whole, the arrangement of those clay minerals is rather random. Now, you can probably imagine what happens if we apply pressure to the shale. A little bit of pressure has already been applied in the transition from the clay to the shale, the, the, the sedimentary or the sediment clay to the shale. That caused a slight reorientation. If we apply more pressure to the shale, 